and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about privacy and public safety and how related cases are impacted by the Constitution. My guest today is Dr. Kevin Johnson. Dr. Johnson is the Director of the Center for First Amendment Studies. Welcome, Kevin, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thank you for having me today. And this is your second go-around here on Talking Points. Yes, and indeed. When you appeared the first time, we talked exclusively about the Supreme Court and some of their recent decisions. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, we had just experienced the recent passing of mm -hmm. Justice Antonin Scalia on the High Court. Mm -hmm. And that left the court with, theoretically, a 4-4 split of mm -hmm. conservatives versus liberals. Mm -hmm. And a lot of folks were expressing concern that this meant that the rest of the term would involve a series of 4-4 ties, tie votes right. on the court, which would essentially stalemate the court. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, that did not happen. Mm -hmm. Actually, there were 55 cases that were ruled upon after Scalia's death during that term. Mm -hmm. Of those 55, 51 of them were decided by a majority vote, and only four were 4-4 ties. Mm -hmm. So if 93% of the cases were decided by a majority vote, mm -hmm. what does that tell us about the sort of enduring functionality of the highest court in the land? Well, as a scholar of the, of the First Amendment, I can tell you that this is what we've known all along. The Supreme Court, uh, we've been trying to dispel the, the myth that it's an ideological court. It does rule ideologically in a few cases that are significant cases on the Supreme Court level. But really, these justices are students and practitioners of the Constitution. And uh, ideology factors into it uh, very little. Most often, it's based on a modality or a constitutional type of uh, interpreting uh, the text. And so uh, do they look at it historically? Or do they look at it as a living document? Or do they look at it, the circumstances of a particular case? And most of the time, these justices agree overwhelmingly on one side or another, and they're not split ideologically. So it's not surprising to me that the number of 4-4 cases has actually been small after the passing of Justice Scalia. Yeah, only 7% were 4-4 mm -hmm. ties. We are going to talk about one of those 4-4 ties, mm -hmm. and that involved a California <coughs> case with the California Teachers mm -hmm. Union. The case was called Rebecca Friedrichs versus the California Teacher Teachers Union. And uh, in that case, there were some non-union teachers who were objecting to paying union fees, mm -hmm. essentially, for collective bargaining that was done mm -hmm. by the unions. And um, the court ruled 4-4 on that case, which mm -hmm. meant that it reverted back to the lower court decision, which was the Ninth Circuit Court here mm -hmm. in California. Mm -hmm. The Ninth Circuit Court had referred to a 1977 Supreme Court ruling in a similar case in Detroit. And uh, that case, I've got it right here, was uh, Abood versus Detroit Board of Education. And in that case, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, forcing non-members to pay for a union's political activities violates the First Amendment, the court said. But, it's un but it is constitutional, however, if the court requires non-members to help pay for the union's collective bargaining efforts mm -hmm. in order to prevent freeloading and ensure mm -hmm. labor peace. So mm -hmm. really, two kinds of fees that can be charged here, one for strictly political activities mm -hmm. and one for collective bargaining activities. Mm -hmm. What do, we, uh, what do we surmise from all of that? Well, I think that the growing trend uh, for Americans is that they want to have control over where their money goes, whether they're a part of an organization or not. And so when people are a part of an organization, they want to be able to say, I want my money to be spent in this way. We see this with a lot of the rhetoric concerning tax paying, right? That we want our money to be going to these purposes in government and my money to be going to these purposes in government. So there's always been this tension about individuals and where their money is being used. I think in this case, it's no different that there are a lot of people who are upset that they pay this fair share collective for the collective bargaining that the union does. And then they wanna know what their dollars are being used for. And if their dollars aren't being used in a way that they want, then they wanna have control over that. And I think that that's the function of every organization. Okay, and so the idea is that uh, it's okay to charge, let's say for example, if a union was charging $10 mm -hmm. for fees, $5 of that goes to strictly political activities and $5, mm -hmm. $5 goes towards collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. If you're a non-member, you still have to pay at least the $5. Yeah, and I think that the big split here uh, uh, refers to this kind of competitive model. So 
when you're teaching a class or when you're a professor, you are uh, a particular commodity in, in terms of the labor that you're doing. And so unions, what they try to do is they try to form an organization that has control over a particular product, which is a laborer, a person that is working in the classroom. Some universities work with unions because they like and value that kind of commodity. They like the professors and people that are in that particular union. Just like if you were in a supermarket and you wanted a particular commodity, uh, say that uh, a, a better analogy might be that if you're entering into a contract uh, with a sports network like Fox Sports, right, and you're in your Major League Baseball, uh, you, you get certain products that come with the Fox Sports line. You can be broadcast on Fox Sports 1, you can be broadcast on Fox Television, and there's a lot of different variations in which you can go, but they've chosen to do business with the Fox organization. And so the same thing is true with, I think, the, the teachers' unions and the labor unions. So when universities and when the public chooses to do business with this particular organization, they get those kinds of goods. So when people don't really like paying their, the, the, the fair share in what that organization is spending their money on, that's when those people want that control and that's where these lawsuits came and took place. Okay, well let's transition now to an issue that does have some correlation with privacy rights mm -hmm. and that is the Texas abortion case mm -hmm. in the past term and this was decided by actually a majority decision. Mm -hmm. And in that case, the case is called Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt. Right. Uh, what happened was uh, Texas passed a law which would have uh, severely reduced the number of abortion clinics that were operating mm -hmm. in the state of Texas. And the law was based upon having very, very rigorous health care standards for abortion clinics. In other mm -hmm. words, full surgical center types of uh, pr uh, facilities mm -hmm. had to be available. and. Um, the court ruled ultimately that that was inappropriate. It wasn't mm -hmm. necessary to have that level of medical procedure because only half of 1% of women who elect to have abortions mm -hmm. need uh, hospital stays afterward. Um, that being the case, um, this is an issue that never seems to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, privacy was the motivating factor for Roe versus Wade mm -hmm. to decide that women did have the right of privacy mm -hmm. for to choose an elective abortion. Mm -hmm. and, but yet Roe versus Wade and related cases keep coming back up. Why is it? Why do cases never quite get settled? Some of these issues are increasingly partisan, right? Uh, uh, issues like abortion and gun rights, all of these, uh, these kinds of constitutional issues are extremely partisan. That's why we point to the 5-4 decisions, right? Uh, what happens in a case like abortion is when you rule that there are abortion rights, the people who are absolutely opposed to that ruling start to try to find ways to curtail the access to abortions. And so that's exactly what happened in the state of Texas. The non-conservative way is on the liberal end of the spectrum. The court declares that there's gun rights. And then uh, the liberal Democrats look for ways to regulate gun manufacturing and production, right? So if you have decreased numbers of facilities in which you can buy guns or you regulate that, then you're able to do that. Now, abortion is certainly not the same as guns, but when we're talking about the Supreme Court rulings, we're talking about people reacting to those rulings, trying to limit access access to that right because it's already ideologically divided. Otherwise, it may not have been a conflict in the courts to begin with. And in layman's terms, uh, either side is always looking for a loophole. Yeah. Some way they can sort of kick the door open. Or, or, or to use the law in a way that benefits their ultimate end goal. So in the case of the abortion clinics, if they don't want people to have abortions, then they limit the number of clinics that abortions can be done. Limiting the number of clinics means that you're limiting the number of women that would have access to those clinics because you're talking about driving across vast amounts of terrain in Texas in order to do that. I mean, Texas is a gigantic state. I don't know if you've ever driven through it, but if there's only 10, 10 clinics in the entire state, that doesn't really afford a lot of access to women that are trying to have an abortion. And so they try to use the laws as a way to limit access, even when it's declared a right by the Supreme Court. So any right that is always declared by a Supreme Court has another opposite reaction that tries to work within that ruling as a constraint to then 
make it uh, limit access in this case. And then, of course, it gets contested, and then it resurfaces and gets brought back to the court. But even then, it's not necessarily a revisitation of the fundamental issues in Roe v. Wade, which are privacy bound. Mm -hmm. What it is, is that it's about the access to that right. And so that's what makes the Supreme Court really tricky, is that they have to wait for a test case that they can hear that's not already a settled area of law in order to make this determination. So if they can't go through the front door, they try the back door. That's right. If the that's back right. door is open. Let's move on mm -hmm. in terms of privacy and talk about uh, what kinds of privacy we can expect in today's uh, world of YouTube and cell phone cameras and mm -hmm. universal access to mm -hmm. security cameras everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, where does my privacy begin and the security camera end? That's a really, really good question. I think that the, that the intersection of privacy and the First Amendment is one of those issues that is going to be at the forefront in the 21st century. It's going to be what is going to occupy a lot of our legal questions, whether, and we'll, we'll probably talk about drones, and we'll talk about security cameras, and we'll talk about cameras being everywhere. We're, we're in a surveillance kind of society where we always are expecting that people are watching us, that we're always under the camera, whether or not you know it's us sitting in traffic making funny faces that are frustrated at uh, other drivers with road rage or whether it's hanging out in our front yards with our kids or whether it's being anywhere in a supermarket where your kid might be throwing a tantrum or whatever right we, we we're always having these cameras on us where we're not really expecting to not be filmed anymore. And, and I think that some people still hold on to that expectation that we're not being filmed and that's where the, the ultimate conflict comes from. I, it's gonna be a, a, an interesting question as to whether where your rights of, of a reasonable expectation of privacy and the rights of being surveyed all the time or, or, or being under surveillance, uh, it, it happens. You know, it's, it's, that, it's that tricky thing that we're not comfortable with, but yet we want for public safety, right? So if I walk out the door, should I assume that uh, as soon as I step out the door, there could be a camera somewhere, even if it's a neighborhood kid down the street? I, I think that that's, a, that that's an expectation, unfortunately, in my opinion, that we have to think about today. Every action that we have could be the instant viral video that happens tomorrow, right? That's the, that's the kind of society that we live in. Now, whether or not we see many generations that go through this where that's not an issue anymore, they know that that's the reality, and then people are more excusing like, well, everybody's had that one moment or these five moments that have occurred on the internet or everybody's got this. And so when it becomes a level playing field there, then I think that maybe the culture might change around the surveillance, but right now it's this uh, conflict between that old expectation of privacy and the new surveillance society, which is what we're all kind of subject to. And we only have about 30 seconds before the break, so if you can, within 30 seconds, tell us about this brave new world of YouTube and social media. Yeah, you know, it's especially uh, problematic when I think you're talking about the school, the school grounds, you know. I mean, these are youth that are subject to these permanent forms of digital media, and they've never had to deal with that before, and I think that that's a, a really problematic area. Okay, on that note, we are going to go to the break. Stay with us. When we come back from the break, we will talk about drones and more about privacy and public safety. Stay tuned. Do you love to travel? Understanding the world and all of its diverse cultures? Ever thought about becoming a foreign service officer? Living in another country and helping to promote a positive image of America? Or going undercover and working for the CIA? Or as a lobbyist, representing different interest groups to members of Congress? You can become a part of this exciting field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly and my guest today is Dr. Kevin Johnson. And Kevin, before we went to the break, we were talking about uh, the so-called surveillance society mm -hmm. that we seem to have developed mm -hmm. for ourselves here with mm -hmm. our modern technology. And mm -hmm. one of those devices, of course, is the drone. Mm -hmm. You can buy a drone now at Barnes & Noble. You can go <laughs> almost any store and buy a right. drone. We see them flying. The FAA has already um, enacted some mm -hmm. rules regarding uh, drone flying mm -hmm. and so forth. 
But this also causes problems because right. we know drones are armed with cameras. Mm -hmm. They tend to fly over neighborhoods, over mm -hmm. parks, over mm -hmm. schools, everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, that causes some conflict mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of folks think those drones are spying on them. Mm -hmm. So what's going on today with drones and drone spying and people reacting by trying to shoot them out of the sky? <laughs> Yeah, indeed, people are trying to shoot them out of the sky. There's all kinds of cases throughout the United States, and they're, they are everywhere. And uh, it's an extension of that phenomenon that I was talking about before. You can't, you, and when you go out today, you almost have to assume that you're being watched everywhere you go. And I think that people are kind of growing uneasy about that, you know? They're, they're growing uneasy about not only being filmed wherever they go, but being filmed in ways and the way that you can edit out film, how is it going to be used? What kind of control do I have over my own image? Do I not own my own image then? And if I don't own my own image, if we're in an image society and we're going increasingly into the visual medium, do I even own myself, right? So now you can create depictions and caricatures of myself that I don't have any control over. So then do you even have ownership over the way that you act in public if people can take these stock images, edit them however they want, put them out uh, however they want. And I think people are increasingly concerned about that. And in terms of uh, the drones and people trying to shoot at them, and mm -hmm. some people have actually mm -hmm. shot at them, we want to make it clear that's that's not legal. No, that is not legal. The only the only small exception, and we I don't think we've even seen a case of this yet, to my knowledge, is is if the drone were to cause a, a personal threat to your safety in terms of firing upon you, if they have a gun attached to the drone in some way, or uh, or Shh, don't taking, give anybody any or, ideas. No, here. no, 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 no. <laughs> or swooping down and trying to you know make contact with somebody or you know, using the drone in a way that the drone was not intended to be used, right, in other words. And so uh, I think that if the drone is misused, you know, then we're entering into this gray area, but nothing's really happened in that, in that front. It's, it's absolutely not legal to shoot your firearm up into the air, number one, let alone to be able to hit a drone because the drone is protected like any other aircraft and it would be like firing on an airplane and you can't do that, the FAA will come after you. And I guess uh, the key thing here is if you really feel that the drone is uh, trespassing on your property, mm -hmm. is, uh, is uh, spying on you in a way that's inappropriate, mm -hmm. there are certain states that have so-called peeping Tom laws. Mm -hmm. And also you can contact your local police department and say that this is a nuisance and mm -hmm. it is trespassing. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, it's not going to be outside the realm of possibility to extend that private ownership above the airspace, you know, right where you're, uh, we've talked about this before, where the blades of grass end and the air begins is the domain of the FAA. I don't think that it's un that it's going to be that way much longer. It might actually extend a little bit higher to where these drones can't be hovering 10 feet above your ground and claiming that they can be in your backyard. I think that uh, that there's going to be some reasonable extension of this limit to where the drones have to be a certain height so, uh, before they can actually be over your yard. Right now the FAA has that rationale because airplanes might fly over, but they're usually, you know, 100 plus feet up in the air. I mean, 100 would be exceptionally low, right? And so I think the drones test that boundary and I wouldn't be surprised if we see some regulations to allow ownership of some reasonable amount of airspace over a home because this technology wasn't there when they established that precedent. Okay, well let's transition now to talk about uh, uh, today people are using their cell phones mm -hmm. to videotape police activities mm -hmm. such as arrests mm -hmm. in progress. Mm -hmm. um, is it uh, completely legal to videotape an officer um, enacting mm -hmm. an arrest procedure? I think it is. Uh, from my studies that I've been able to gather so far, I think that it's legal to tape those. And one of the reasons behind that is because we have freedom of press in the United States. And one of the rationales for the freedom of the press is to be able to hold public officials accountable. And the police officers are public officials and they're executing arrests. And as we have independent citizen journalists, they're going to want to record these arrests to hold public officials accountable. And I think that recording those arrests is perfectly within the right of the public to be able to know. So I don't think that that's gonna be a contested area 
too much in the courts. Now, they can't get too close in interrupting an arrest. They can't, you know, uh, compromise the safety and security of the officer. So if they're, you know, getting in the middle of, 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 a, of you know, a, a holdup, you know, where there's, where there's, you know, the, the, the person that they're seeking to arrest has a gun drawn and the police have guns drawn and then the recorder kinds of tries to come in, maybe that's compromising things. So there's, there's some limitations, but just filming an arrest is not, uh, is not a, a problem as far as I can tell. And uh, public safety officers and public safety agencies have responded by uh, using their own cameras, mm -hmm. uh, such as dash cams mm -hmm. on highway patrol cars, mm -hmm. as well as body cams, what they call body cams, mm -hmm. which are little cameras on the front of mm -hmm. the shirt of an officer. Mm -hmm. So are the police uh, protecting themselves in many ways by using these cameras so that they're not the victims of unwarranted kinds of attacks later? Yeah, I think that there's, that there's, two, there's, there's two things going on, right? Uh, one thing is that the public has uh, have been skeptical in some cases where those cameras have been turned off. Uh, in, in particular moments where they think are convenient for the police officer to turn them off and then turn them back on or do some activity off the camera and then do some activity on. Uh, however, the larger issue here, I think, why it's in the, the police department's interest is because it's about building confidence with the public, right? I, I think that confidence in policing is certainly uh, at a low right now in terms of the, the abuse and misconduct of police departments. And so the public, so police departments have a vested interest in increasing the the confidence in their departments. And uh, cameras are one way that they can go about doing that. If they can record everything that they do, if they can put it out there, and they can be transparent, and they can share with the community all of these things that they are doing, uh, then I think that that serves to increase the confidence on that on, in, in terms of the public. Because uh, we invest police officers with a tremendous amount of power and responsibility and guidelines and restrictions and regulations. And with that, we demand some accountability, right? And so I think that those cameras are a tool that police officers and police departments are using to be able to help establish their credibility and confidence with the public. Well, let's talk now about um, public safety and what happened in the Orlando, the terrible shooting in the Orlando nightclub mm -hmm. where 49 people were killed. Mm -hmm. We found out, of course, that the suspect in that case was uh, attacking because he was, uh, he was identifying with ISIS. Mm -hmm. And he was talking in, in the 911 call that he made to the dispatcher he was talking about the caliphate mm -hmm. and talking about support of ISIS and the fact that the U.S. was mm -hmm. uh, in the wrong with all of the drones mm -hmm. and the bombings and so on mm -hmm. that were killing Muslims in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Well, the FBI, when they released the initial transcripts uh, of the recording, deleted the part which seemed to indicate that this was a classic case of someone who would be considered, quote unquote, an extremist Islamic mm -hmm. terrorist. Mm -hmm. um, but then later, a uh, FOIA, which is a Freedom of Information Act request, mm -hmm. and a judge forced the FBI to release uh, those full mm -hmm. transcripts, in which case we did see that those statements and comments were made. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, in those few months where uh, that information was not made public, the local press and the, indeed the national press was speculating on all kinds of motives for the gunman. Mm -hmm. Perhaps he was homophobic because this was a gay nightclub and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Isn't that counterproductive for the FBI and the Justice Department to withhold that kind of information when public safety is supposed to be paramount mm -hmm. and we're supposed to be concerned about terrorist acts and uh, these kinds of attacks? Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I really don't know. I mean, I'm not in the business uh, of combating terrorism. I'm not a counterterrorism expert. I don't know the kinds of things that are necessary in order to uh, to combat these things, especially when it comes to the, the kind of secret and covert operations that might be necessary to not share this kind of intelligence. The one thing that I think that is that, that, that this incident really questions for me is the quick attribution of motives that are sought in, in, in terms of, of this type of, of crime. This was an incident at, uh, in a very in a queer environment. And when these kinds of incidents occur, like at the Pride Parade where there was a, a shooting as well. Um, the the community that's being targeted can't help but feel that this is a target 
on a historically marginalized community. They feel that. And, 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 and I think that rushing to motive in terms of, of figuring out, is this Islamic terrorism? Is this terrorism? Is this you know, Muslim terrorism? Is, you know, what kind of term do we want to label this kind of terrorism? I think that for at least the, the, the queer population that is concerned with the events of that nightclub, they don't feel like it's necessarily an attack on, uh, on, a, on a nationalism. It's not on a sense of patriotism. It's an attack on their identity, that it wasn't a, another type of club that was, that was targeted, and that officials, public officials, many of which weren't even able to talk about this being a gay nightclub, that they just called it a nightclub, that it wasn't, and that there wasn't any, uh, any discussion about the impact that this has on on that community, I think was uh, was what was problematic. Uh, but I uh, but I do think that the secondary issue here is in terms of a, of, a, of a temporal relation, right? We want to immediately get the reporting. We want to immediately know why this happened. We want to immediately assess that situation, and instead of immediately identifying with who was targeted here and not necessarily figuring out motives immediately. That's going to be the course of an investigation. But in terms of our media coverage, of course, we want to know why this happened, who was the shooter, what was their motive, you know, and all of those questions. But that takes time usually to determine. And that was certainly the case in this. What we could instead do is focus on how this crime feels. And it felt like an attack on the queer community. All right, well, we only have one minute left, mm -hmm. um, so I want to give you about a minute to talk about cyberbullying and regulation of the internet, mm -hmm. if that's possible. Uh, let's talk about mm -hmm. schools for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, what can schools do to regulate, if possible, uh, the cyberbullying that's led to some high profile suicides among school age kids? Well, cyberbullying is really tough because right now the criminal justice system is basically the only way that they can uh, that they can have recourse for any cyberbullying attacks that happen and originate off campus in the digital environment. So principals, when they look at it, they say, this may not even be my jurisdiction. I suspect that what needs to happen is the principals need to figure out a way to have the digital schoolhouse gate conceptualized so that a person's First Amendment right is protected in terms of student speech, while also letting school administrators be involved in this so we're not just immediately turning to prosecution of teenagers and preteens when it comes to their speech in digital environments. Okay, on that note, we do have to come to a close. I want to thank you for being here again and sharing this knowledge with us. And thank you for being with us on this edition of Talking Points. Join us soon for another episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.